Hi everybody and welcome to the latest podcast for Honors Biology at Desert Ridge High School. I'm Mr. Galladay and today we're going to be talking about genes, populations, and variations. That's right, we're talking about genes and I don't mean trousers uh, and how those vary in populations as opposed to individuals. Uh, up until this point we've been really talking about uh, genes and, and how those are passed down from parent to offspring. Uh, but now we're going to be looking at genes and how they uh, change in different populations of individuals. Okay, so this is a good point to update your table of contents and your organization in your notebook, and here we go. Uh, first thing to, that we're going to start with is a just a quick review of the differences between uh, polygenic traits and single gene traits. Uh, single gene traits, as you may recall, these are observable traits that are controlled by a single gene. Uh, they usually are uh, inherited in the form of sing, uh, simple Mendelian inheritance, although they can also be uh, incomplete dominant genes. Um, yeah, and in populations, we usually see these genes in an either-or pattern, such as we're, we're showing here, where we have either one or the other, right? Now now this bar graph can, can change depending on uh, which one is more or less uh, common in the population. Um, some examples that we've talked about in, in human, uh, human terms, things like widow's peak, hemophilia, and so on. Uh, these are things that, that we can um, look at a particular allele, look at it in the population, and, uh, and see how it varies. And so the y-axis, of course, would be the percent of population, and the x-axis would be uh, the particular uh, allele that we're talking about, whether it's widow's peak or hemophilia or, or whatever particular gene we're, we're looking at. Uh, now that's contrasted with a polygenic trait. And polygenic traits, as we have said, are observable traits that are controlled by two or more genes and they are typically inherited and, and cause some, some, some form of a blending pattern. Um, uh, these are things that interact with the environment in very complex ways. So these might be things that are affected by learning, diet, social interactions, and, and so on. All of these things that are, are examples that can affect uh, these traits. And we've talked about many, many examples of these. These are typically the, the most important traits uh, that you think of. When you, when you imagine a friend or you describe a friend to a person, um, usually you, you, you won't use one of these, right? You won't typically def define them in terms of whether they have a widow's peak or attached earlobes or something like that. Um, you're going to talk about something about their in, in appearance, uh, their behavior, and so on. So these tend to be much more uh, Im important uh, traits that that are um, in, at least certainly in, in human terms, right? And we've said often that these are uh, traits that are distributed in a bell-shaped curve, and we've used some several examples of things like height, athletic ability, intelligence, and so on. All of these things are influenced not only by genetics, but also uh, your interactions with the environment, right? Things like learning, diet, social interactions, and, and so on. So these are very, very complex traits that have some genetic basis, and they also have some environmental basis. Um, but in the end, we can describe them in, a, in sort of a bell-shaped curve, that you have sort of an average, right, or a, uh, a central tendency, whether we use a, a median or a mean or some other central tendency measure. Uh, and then it's distributed in that population in this sort of bell-shaped curve. Uh, so the percent of population we would have on our Y-shaped axis, and then the range of this, whether this is intelligence or uh, height or athletic ability or something like that, right? Uh, where there is some median or some uh, central place where most people fall, and then as you fall to the opposite ends, you have fewer and fewer people out here at, uh, at the extremes. Okay, so the next couple of terms that we want to define are um, populations and gene pools. So we've been talking about populations, so you might wonder, well, what the heck is a population? Um, well, a population is a group of individuals in a particular place that interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Okay, uh, so that's our standard definition of a population that you may have learned in, uh, in an ecology unit. Uh, in, in junior high, 
um, and this is the same uh, the same definition that we'll be using throughout the year, right? So um, one of the, the the reasons for using this idea of fertile offspring, right, is there are uh, hybrids, uh, things like horses uh, and donkeys that can interbreed but do not produce fertile offspring, right? So you can take uh, a horse and a donkey, interbreed them and produce a mule, um, which is a hybrid, but it is not fertile. So the, that's not, mules are their own population, but they're neither a horse nor a donkey because they're not fertile, okay? Um, so that brings us to the idea of a gene pool. And a gene pool typically describes all alleles for all genes that are present in a population. So in a particular population, you have a per particular percentage of uh, all alleles, everything from eye color to hair color to all the alleles that form all of our uh, proteins that make up our bodies and so on. Okay. Now this can vary from population to population. If you imagine the population of, let's say, China uh, and compare and contrast that with uh, a population, let's say, in Norway, um, the blue-eyed gene would be uh, the allele that would cause blue eyes or alleles that would result in blue eyes would predictably or we would expect it to be somewhat more common in Norway than it would be in, in China. So again that can vary uh, the gene pool varies from population to population. And that brings us to this idea of relative frequency. So relative frequency just describes how often a particular allele occurs within a gene pool. Okay, so if we continue with that previous example of um, the alleles that result in blue eye color, um, the relative frequency of the blue-eyed allele in Norway uh, would be relatively more frequent than uh, the how often it occurs in, in China. Or at least that's what we would I would certainly expect to find. Um, I'll just make this side note. Sometimes people. Uh, see relative frequency and they might think that that's how often grandma comes to visit or something like that but that's uh, that's not what that means at all okay um, here's one example to not get confused with um, in our uh, co-dominant uh, example that we used earlier about the four o'clock flowers uh, where we have red pink and white um, and and so you might be tempted to think of relative frequencies related to the phenotypes. Well, in this example, it's certainly related, but this is not uh, relative frequency, right? Because these are phenotypes. And relative frequency talks about alleles. So if we want to graph the relative frequency, we would not use this, but instead we would have to use the alleles, right? And if you look at this example, uh, the red allele is slightly more common than the white allele. In this particular example, we only have two alleles, um, the red and the white, and the heterozygous uh, case gives us pink. Okay, So don't get confused uh, when you talk about relative frequency. Um, it, is, it is related to phenotypes, um, but really what we're talking about is the relative frequency of alleles, right? not phenotypes. Okay. Uh, one more thing to review in this, and, and that is the sources of genetic variation. Um, and so far we've talked about three. Uh, the first one occurs during fertilization. And during fertilization, of course, you have a mixture of gametes from uh, each parent. Uh, and each of those gametes, they, they rate or as the, the sperm that fertilizes an egg uh, out of the millions and millions of combinations uh, present in both parents, uh, those combine to create new, new individuals. And of course the variation in those gametes comes from meios meiosis. And there are two sources of variation that occur there. The first of, of all is that the chromosomes get shuffled randomly. Um, so each individual that produces gametes, uh, those chromosomes are a random shuffling of um, the, the chromosomes which that person inherited from each of uh, his or her parents. Um, and the other thing that happens in meiosis is we have this crossing over that recombines alleles. Um, the third thing that is um, ultimately the, the, the source of all genetic variation is mutations. Uh, and we said that mutations are any change in DNA sequence and we usually think of those as being negative but uh, they are uh, in fact, most often they do absolutely nothing. They are 
um, occasionally uh, uh, harmful and very 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 rarely they result in something that, that can be beneficial. Um, but the important thing is that only mutations to gametes are inherited, right? So any mutation that occurs to a somatic cell, to a skin cell, a muscle cell, or anything else um, is not necessary, is, well, is not going to be inherited. Um, as we've said, most mutations are invisible. Uh, humans have um, about 175 mutations per generation, right? Now, that sounds like a lot, but out of uh, the, th the three and a half billion um, uh, base pairs, that's not a, a, a terribly large number. Uh, that 175 out of 3.5 billion uh, is a relatively small percentage. Important thing to understand here is that when we talk about genetic variation, all genetic variation initially uh, came about as a mutation, right? Um, and so when geneticists talk about alleles, gene variations, and mutations, um, they're really talking about the same thing. All of these, these three terms are uh, essentially, um, uh, well, they all mean the same thing, right? So these are all synonyms for each other. Okay, last topic to talk about, um, again, is to compare and contrast individuals and populations. Uh, this often does get confusing, so I, I want to be sure that we're, we're very clear. Um, individuals, any individual is born uh, and dies with a particular set of alleles, right? So each of these flowers, uh, no matter what, it is born with that particular set of alleles that causes that particular flower color. It can only pass on the alleles that they have to their offspring. So this one, no matter how much it wants to have uh, a white offspring, um, its offspring can only be red or pink because it, uh, it is homozygous for that particular allele. So um, I don't know if flowers actually want to have offspring of a particular color or not, but um, the, the, the reality is, is that those individuals can only pass on the, the alleles that they have. Populations, on the other hand, are quite a bit more variable. Um, and that's because populations are made of gene pools that have many sets of alleles distributed among the members, right? So we've got some number of red at any point in time and some number of white alleles, and that uh, amount can go up or down uh, depending from, from generation to generation. That, that particular ratio can, can change. Um, genetic variation within a population allows the population to persist even when conditions might be unfavorable for some individuals in the population, right? So if we imagine a situation of a disease which only affects red flowers, um, that would be uh, very disastrous for these individuals that are red, but because we have variation in our population, uh, the, the, the population can persist even though those red flowered individuals are, are out of luck, right? Um, it's important to note that relative frequency of alleles is not, I repeat, not related to a trait being dominant or recessive. Now, this is sometimes something that, that people get confused about, but here's uh, a, a very real example. Uh, this is a condition called polydactyly, and there are different types of polydactyly, but this particular type results in a, uh, a, the person having an extra little finger um, over just uh, to the outside of their, their normal little finger. Um, and so the person, uh, this person, as you can see, has, um, has this sixth little finger out here. And this is actually a dominant, um, a dominant allele. Okay, now this is quite rare. Uh, it's much less than 1% of the population. Again, that depends on where you go. Uh, some parts of the world, this condition is, is more rare than in, in other uh, locations. It tends to be more rare in the U.S. Uh, than in some parts of Africa and, um, and India, um, but for the most part, uh, but still, it's, it's quite rare. Um, so the, the relative frequency of the, the alleles is going to be very, very, very high, right? So even though this is dominant, right, it is still quite rare. So most individuals that have this condition are probably going to be um, heterozygous. So if it's not related to whether an allele is dominant or recessive, it must be related to something else. And that something else is what we're going to be looking at 
uh, in, in, in future discussions and in future lectures and in future lab activities in class. Okay, so here's a few questions that I want you to uh, jot down the answer to on the left hand side of your notebook. Uh, so these are things that you should review and you should be able to answer um, as, as you uh, go through this particular list. Um, and these are things that, I, again, like I said, I'd like you to jot down some quick answers uh, to these, these questions on the left-hand page of your, of your notebook. Okay, so that ends our discussion of populations and uh, variation. And on that note of polydactyly, I'm going to wave goodbye, and I hope you have a great day.